please have the study guide for the final exam handy as you listen to this recording. I'm going to go through the list of bulleted items on the study guide and highlight some key points that I think are important to remember in preparation for the exam. So starting with the first item, which is to distinguish between, between a job description and a job specification. All right, job description is a statement that identifies the objectives of a job, the type of work to be done, the responsibilities and duties inherent in the position, the working conditions, and the relationship of the job to other functions in the organization. Now, a job specification would include the minimum qualifications required to actually get a job. And sometimes you see where the job specification is actually incorporated within the job description. All right, next item is to distinguish amongst theory X, Y, and Z management styles. Now, theory X and theory Y, those styles were developed by um, a theorist named Douglas McGregor. And with the theory X management style, um, managers who have this style believe that people dislike work. They feel that workers need to be controlled and they need a lot of direction. That workers, they're going to avoid responsibility when they can. And the main factors that actually motivate them to do their work are fear and money. In other words, fear of losing their job and the need for money to be able to survive. Now, if we contrast that with the theory why uh, management style, those types of managers actually believe that people, they, that they like work, that most people accept and seek out responsibility, that people actually even use imagination and creativity in order to be able to solve problems. Now, the um, next theory was the theory Z management style. And with this one, we find some of the characteristics include that it incorporates long-term employment, collective decision-making, as well as individual responsibility. All right, next item is main provisions of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Civil Rights Act of 1991. All right, the 1964 Act, the Title VII part, prohibited discriminating in hiring, firing, compensation, apprenticeships, training, terms and conditions of employment based on race, religion, creed, sex, or national origin. Now in the 1991 Act, and this applied to firms with over 15 employees, it extended the right to a jury trial and provided punitive damages to victims of intentional job discrimination. All right, next item is Hertzberg's motiv motivating factors. And if you recall, we did have a discussion posting about Hertzberg. And Hertzberg said that some factors that might motivate employees on the job would be to make their jobs interesting, to help employees to achieve their objectives, and to recognize achievement through advancement and perhaps added responsibility. Now remember Hertzberg also said that there were these, what he called hygiene factors um, on the job. And the hygiene factors were the things that um, people expected to get as part of their job, but wouldn't necessarily motivate them to work harder. So it's important to remember for Hertzberg, he had some things where he said that uh, those factors would motivate employees and other factors where he said people just expected to have them um, present in the job were what he referred to as the hygiene factors. All right, next item is expectancy, expectancy theory and equity theory. All right, and expectancy theory, um, someone who is uh, using this theory might uh, ask themselves some questions such as, hmm, can I accomplish this task? And if I do it, what is my reward? Is the reward worth the effort? And, you know, people sometimes use expectancy theory. They don't necessarily label it that way, but that's really what they're doing um, when they make decisions. And I remember as a student, I would use expectancy theory um, at the end of a semester in trying to decide uh, what final grade that I wanted, in other words, my reward, and how much effort it was going to take to be able to get the grade I wanted and whether that reward was worth the effort. So in other words, I used expectancy theory uh, pretty often in trying to decide um, what final grade I wanted, and also in the same term, how much effort it was going to take to be able to get it. All right, now the other theory, equity theory, is where employees are trying to maintain equity between uh, the effort they put in and the output or rewards that they get. And they're comparing that 
to other employees in similar positions. So in other words, it's not just about themselves and how much effort they put in and the reward they get back. It's also they're making that comparison to what other employees are doing, and how much effort they have to be, have to put in and how what the rewards are based on that effort and does it appear to be equitable um, with other employees. All right, next item is sexual harassment. All right, and with sexual harassment, there are two different types of harassment, two key types. And the first one is what we refer to as quid pro quo sexual harassment. And that's the one that tends to be more overt. In other words, the type of thing where if someone, one employee or a supervisor, let's say usually it's someone in a position of authority, says to another employee, well, if, um, if you agree um, to go out with me and perform sexual favors, um, I'll make sure that uh, that you are on a track for advancement, that uh, you will be rewarded accordingly based upon your compliance with, with the request. Or in turn, someone might say, you know, they, that, that they want, if a supervisor says to an employee, you know, they want them to perform sexual favors and the, um, they're uh, essentially threatened that if they don't comply, that they could be terminated in their job. In other words, something like that would qualify as quid pro quo sexual harassment. Now, the other type of sexual harassment is what we call hostile work environment. And this is a uh, conduct that would serve to interfere with a worker's job performance or perhaps create an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. And you know, it's important here to recognize that courts have placed uh, more emphasis on whether the conduct itself was actually unwelcome. In other words, it, unwelcome meaning that would be a term for behavior that would offend a reasonable person. All right, next item is the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 was the concept of accommodation and employment. All right, the ADA would prohibit employers from discriminating against qualified individuals with disabilities in hiring, advancement, or compensation, and requires them to adapt the workplace if necessary. It's this whole notion of reasonable accommodation, treating people according to their specific needs. And normally when we think about reasonable accommodation, we're thinking about perhaps the situation if, an, if someone uh, who's disabled can perform most of the duties of the job, there might be some um, shifting of duties whereby um, the, the person who's disabled would do most of the job, but certain things that they couldn't do, other employees you know, would, would take care of those aspects of the work. Or it could be that you know, based on someone's physical disability, maybe there is some minor retrofitting in the building to be able to accommodate that particular um, person's uh, physical disability. All right, next item is Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Who does it cover? All right, this act outlawed employment practices that discriminate against people who are 40 years of age and over. All right, next item is what is comparable worth? And this is a concept that was popular back in the 1980s. Um, it's kind of fallen out of vogue here more recently. You don't really see it used too often. But it's um, the type of uh, situation where people in jobs um, requiring similar education, training, or skills should receive equal pay. In other words, that was the whole premise behind the principle of comparable worth. All right, next item is what is an open shop? All right, this is a situation where union membership is voluntary for new employees. All right, if we compare that with what is a union shop, this is um, the type of situation where the employer can hire anyone, but that employees have to join the union after they've been hired. And we find that the majority of labor agreements are of this type. All right, the next item is to distinguish between a mediator and an arbitrator. All right, now a mediator is essentially a negotiator. Um, he or she is trying to help two opposing sides to find a compromise to a dispute. Whereas with an arbitrator, an arbitrator has the authority to render a binding decision in a dispute. All right, next item is what is a right to work law? All right, this law makes union shops illegal in states that have right to work laws. And we find that many states in the southern part of the United States have right to work laws in place. All right, what is the doctrine of employment at will? 
and this many many employees are actually hired um, in a situation whereby it is an employment at will relationship and a couple examples might help to be able to illustrate this principle like for instance um, let's say that someone works for an employer and that uh, organization they're having some financial difficulties and they have to engage in some um, layoffs and some cutbacks they have to reduce the number of employees well you know in an employment at will situation it would be perfectly acceptable to terminate someone for you know financial reasons um, the employee who's being terminated may have done his or her job actually very well but based upon the financial situation it would be acceptable um, to uh, terminate that employee or sometimes you see in situations where um, let's say there's a merger between two firms and you don't need as many employees as you had to before and it's an employment at will relationship um, some employees are terminated in that type of situation too and you know something like that based on employment at will um, would be acceptable as well all right, the next item is to know the four P's of marketing, also known as the marketing mix. All right, remember they include the product, the price, the place, as well as promotion. In other words, once you have your product selected, you have to decide how you're going to price it. You have to decide um, the place or how you're going to distribute it. And you also have to decide how you're going to promote that particular product. All right, next item says know what market segmentation is. And this is where you divide your market into groups that have similar characteristics. And related to that, the next point is to know what target marketing is. And this is where you select the groups based on your market segmentation that the firm can actually serve profitably. In other words, you want to serve the ones that um, likely will make you uh, the most money. All right. So, all right, so moving from there, next point is to know what the break-even point is. And this is where the revenues from sales are equal to all the costs. All right, and the next item is to know what demographic and psychographic variables are in marketing. And if you recall, we had a discussion posting related to this, um, this item. Uh, demographic variables would include those uh, such as age, income, education, race, and religion. Psychographic variables would include things like a group's uh, values, attitudes, and interests. Uh, next item is to understand what a channel of distribution consists of. All right, this is a set of marketing intermediaries, uh, brokers, wholesalers, retailers, uh, who all uh, join forces, who join together to transport goods from producers to consumers. All right, and the next item is to know what is contained in a balance sheet, income statement, and a cash flow statement. Now, for a balance sheet, remember that it includes assets, liabilities, and owner's equity. And for an income statement, it includes revenues and selling costs over a period of time. And with a cash flow statement, it includes cash receipts and disbursements related to operations, investments, and financing. All right, next item is to know what the term liquidity means in relationship to an asset. All right, and with liquidity, we're thinking about how fast an asset can be converted to cash. All right, next item says to know what the fundamental accounting equation is. All right, and this is where assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. Assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. All right, next bullet is to know the difference between the primary and secondary, mar secondary markets for securities. All right, in the primary market, um, the uh, securities are sold in what's referred to as an initial public offering or IPO. And then in the secondary market, those stocks actually are traded uh, between investors. All right, next bullet is to know the various provisions that can be associated with bonds. All right, I provided a handout for you um, with that information, and your textbook also includes uh, some of that information. So I would just go, at, go back and review you know, those various provisions associated with bonds. All right, know what it means when a bond is selling at a premium or a discount. All right, when it's selling at a premium, it's selling at a price that's above its face value. And when it's selling at a discount, it's selling at a price that's below its face value. All right, and if we bring in the next point there, relationship between interest rates and bond prices. 
Um, a couple examples here will help. Um, let's say, for instance, that um, I have a bond and it's paying a 5% interest rate. And I want to sell that bond before maturity. All right, and let's say that interest rates in the marketplace have gone up to be 7%. In other words, someone else can easily purchase a comparable bond with a 7% interest rate on it. Well, it's likely if I want to sell my bond that potential purchasers, if they're being rational about it, are not going to want to pay me the face value of the bond if my bond only pays 5% when well, they can get a comparable bond in the marketplace for 7%. So if I want to sell that bond before it matures, it's likely I'm going to have to sell that bond at a discount. All right, in other words, at a price that's below its face value since it's holding in an interest rate that's less than the prevailing interest rate in the marketplace. Now, if we take a little different example, all right, let's say that I still have that 5% bond, but let's say that interest rates in the marketplace have fallen to 3%. In other words, that um, if someone were to buy a comparable bond, that the best they could do in the marketplace would be 3%. Well, in that case, all right, if I'm being rational, I know I have a bond. If I want to sell it before maturity, that has an interest rate on it that's higher than the prevailing rate in the marketplace. So it's likely that I'm not going to be willing to sell that bond for its face value. In other words, I'm going to expect that to sell that bond, that someone's going to pay me a premium, in other words, a price over its face value, in order to be able to purchase that bond. All right, next item is to know the voting rights of common and preferred stockholders. All right, common stockholders can vote for the board of directors. All right, but preferred stockholders generally do not vote for the board of directors. All right, and next item is to know what it means to say that a preferred stock has a cumulative provision. All right, this is the case where if dividends to the preferred stockholders are not paid when they're due, um, those dividends do what we call accumulate in arrears. In other words, they don't go away. That eventually those dividends have to be paid to the preferred stockholders before common stockholders can be paid dividends. All right, next item is to know what we mean by bulls and bears in the stock market. All right. When we say someone's a bull in the stock market or they're bullish about the stock market, that means that they're feeling optimistic. They're feeling positive about the stock market. They think it's going to do well. All right, versus if we say that someone is a bear in the stock market or they're feeling bearish about the stock market, that means that they're, um, they have negative feelings about the markets. They don't think the markets are going to do well. So therefore, they, you know, they, they, they're, not, they're not optimistic about the future direction of the market. They don't think it's going to do as well. Okay. All right. Next item is who sets margin rates. Okay. Remember, that's the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve. All right. And that was one of the questions that was actually on the, um, on the assignment that I gave you um, about the Federal Reserve. Um, you know, there was a question in there about, um, about margin requirements. And remember that it actually is the Board of Governors who actually sets, sets, those, uh, sets those margin rates. All right, the next item is uh, what is the Dow Jones Industrials Average? All right, this is an index. It's, it's widely reported in the financial news that represents the average cost of 30 selected industrial stocks. All right, the next item is to know the tools of the Federal Reserve, the reserve requirement, open market operations discount rate, federal funds rate. Um, I gave everyone um, an internet assignment on the Federal Reserve that would, that would help to highlight the meaning of these various terms. So it's important to do that assignment carefully. And um, when you submit the assignment, I'm going to grade that quickly and give you feedback um, on anything that you've answered incorrectly in that assignment. And that will certainly help to um, prepare and remember these various tools of the Federal Reserve in preparation for the test. All right, the next item is uh, Roth IRAs. And this is an IRA where you don't get upfront deductions on your taxes as you would with a traditional IRA but the earnings grow tax-free in the IRA and they're tax-free when they're withdrawn. So sometimes um, younger people uh, find that Roth IRAs are a more desirable investment as compared to a traditional IRA because um, typically as a younger person you're making um, less money so even if um, 
you don't get those upfront deductions on your taxes as you would with a traditional IRA. Then later on, when you actually um, go to take those funds out um, later on in life, uh, you get the benefit where the earnings have grown tax-free and then they're tax-free when they're withdrawn. All right, next item is, is what is included in the M1 and M2 money supply. All right, M1 can be accessed quickly and easily and includes coins, paper money, checks, and traveler's checks. All right, and M2 includes everything in M1 and it includes funds that take longer to obtain. Things like uh, savings accounts, money market accounts, mutual funds, CDs, things of that nature. All right, the next item is the product life cycle. All right, so we're looking at the product life cycle with what happens to sales and profits over time for a particular product class. And remember that the product life cycle has four stages in it, which include introduction, growth, maturity, and decline. All right, and the last bullet, bulleted item there is round lots versus odd lots. And remember that round lots include 100 shares and that odd lots include less than 100 shares. And as you review for the exam, if you have further questions, please be sure to contact me with any questions that you may have.